Hello everyone. Welcome to the CAS Research Seminar. My name is Jane Klossick and I'm the convener of the research seminar. And this is our first seminar of the 2020-2021 season. Very excited to have a very interesting topic today, which is representation of the home in lockdown. Although I think I understand that two of our speakers are varying on this theme slightly. It would be really great if you could tweet about your experiences and if you'd like to tag us, then our Twitter account is the Art, Architecture and Design Research London Met account and it's at research under slash LM Arts. And it'd be really great if you could follow that account for up to updates. Normally, any last minute changes, that's where there'll be, the word will be spread. The rest of the seminar schedule will be online in the next few days. I'm sorry, I can't share the link with you now. But if you follow that Twitter account, that's at research under slash LM Arts, then when the full schedule is published, I'll be tweeting it to there. So tonight, talking about representation of the home in lockdown, we have Rita Adamo, Nicola Blake, and Francis Hollis. Rita is currently engaged in doing a PhD at the Department of Architecture and Territory at, go on Rita, will you say the, the name of your university? Uh, Università degli Studi di Reggio Calabria in Italy. <laughs> and today she's going to start with a discussion of the representation of her students' own homes in lockdown. And then she's going to relate this with her own studio experience at London Met, when students lived in the studio, and how that links to the project that she's currently undertaking in Belmonte. Nicola Blake is an architect at David Cohn Architects, and she's going to present an independent research project. And in fact, it's the, the, Nicola, the work of Nicola which inspired this whole seminar. Her independent research project is called Representations of the Home During COVID-19 Lockdown. And finally, Frances Hollis will speak, and she is a, a stalwart of the research seminar and an expert in working from home. She's written a book that traces the history of the work home. And today she's going to be talking about representations of the home, COVID and working from home, but not necessarily all at the same time. So now I'm going to hand you over to Rita. And mute to myself. Oh, hi. Thank you, Jane. For the that's what, that'll be one gonna, thing out the way, won't it? I'm going to share directly with my screen. Just on, I don't know if, yeah. I don't know if you feel the same, Rita, but I really like it. If you're actually in front of your screen, you can read the sky really easily. Your camera. What do you mean? Sorry? Not, not you. What are the home All the audience. Oh, oh. Somebody's, somebody's oh. not muted. And there's lots of noise. Hang on. I'll just see if I can mute. Okay. Thanks, Rita. <laughs> um, I was just going to ask all the, the audience, if you're actually there sitting in front of your computer, it's really nice if you can switch your camera on. For the presenters, it's really nice to be able to see faces. So otherwise you're sort of staring into a black abyss and it's very odd. So if you could switch your camera on, obviously you might be doing things that you don't want everyone else to see. But um, in that case, don't feel pushed to switch your camera on. Rita. <laughs> okay. Hello. Um, thank you again, Jane. And um, also, I mean, like in the alpha as well of uh, Sandra, Denise Polker and Jen McAllister, because uh, yeah, the the the, mm, the talk I will the research or the beginning of a 
experiment, I would say more, is something that we just started uh, with their studio, Studio 3, which is the studio uh, they have at the CAS in undergrads, where, where, which has been since 2016 uh, working in, um, in Calabria. And uh, I was also part of the studio in, in postgrad, which was between, uh, no studio, sorry, Unit 6, that also has a satellite there. And as a student, and uh, I was, uh, I co-founded, I, um, together with other uh, older, like uh, grad cast graduated, uh, London Met graduated, uh, um, uh, a, a, a collective that worked in the same village, Belmonte Calabro in Calabria. So like, and always uh, experiment the, and the, the, blur, uh, the boundaries between practice and education. So coming from, the university directly tried to uh, setting up a real project in a real context. So, and then since I finished my um, part two at London Met, I decided to start a PhD and uh, it's based in, uh, in Calabria as well, in the university here, but it's also, I'm also um, having Sandra as a co-supervisor. And uh, so I, I'm still in contact of, fully with their studio and student, obviously. So I'm just, why it doesn't go? Sorry. Um, ah. So when the lockdown started, um, in Italy it was already a, a month that uh, we were locked. I mean, my parents, my family was in lockdown. So I left, as soon as, as, soon as uni is closed, uh, I left and I started to be part of their team meetings, even from Italy. Just, because I really wanted to be obviously look with uh, what the students were, uh, were uh, producing on, on Calabria, which is also my hometown. And this was one of the first um, uh, meeting I had. And, uh, and I was very impressed how anyway, somehow something that I never imagined would be happen, like could happen in a way that studio becoming a screen would, would work. But somehow it's, it seems like works working and having kind of good time, good time um, conversation and sharing of information. And it was the first time we, I was seeing something online and we realized, I realized after a week that everyone was kind of adapting in this way. But uh, it seems very, like seems very extraordinary when the first time. So I knew my friend uh, was writing this journal in Domus how we inhabit in quarantine a journal and I was so excited so I talked to her about this way of teaching and how she, they were doing and how anyway students would work and showing their works and stuff she kind of like obviously not more not the digital part which she was already used since a month but more like the fact that the, there were people working in London about Calabria so she, uh, I, I, uh, we decided with Sandra Jane to ask students how they were working and living in their own, in their house. So these are fo some photos of some of the students took. This is also, actually was not Studio 3 student, it was Studio 7, but this, their studio was together in, at the uh, London Met last year. So it was also kind of a mix of, of interaction between students and also the project were really similar between Athens and Calabria. This is another, uh, guys, Paris, another student who, who collages his home and he was the one who could take his model home before uni closed. So we could, we could have some of Belmonte model on there, his floor and cutting pieces and everything was kind of all, all in once together. And uh, this was then uh, the, the, the Domus article that uh, after an interview, after a chat also with Sandra Jane, my friend uh, wrote for her journal. And uh, this kind of start to have a conversation about what does it mean about the studio living space. And I thought also when we were in London, we were using our studio as a place to, to live and uh, we were eating there. We were, I was, it's not far that I left that time. And when, as a, when I was doing my research last year, I was anyway using their studio just because I needed that uh, motivation coming even from youngest uh, people like the youngest uh, fellow and this for example was really late at night someone sleeping on the floor Lida. <laughs> or like presentation and continuous chatting between each other that for me especially in my third year uh, was really important and was giving a, that extra layer of inf like 
how to do something that you're never going to ask a tutor because you really need your someone else like just to share experience and information and how this anyway even if the teams and the gender gen were giving the best out of the digital uh, tech that we, with the digital tools we start to learn was something that you couldn't really reproduce in working you know at home and uh, that's why i thought well belmonte has a lot of space which now all of us i mean uh, no, no now is something that uh, is daily at least in italy i don't know like uh, on a news like how does uh, marginal areas like internal areas of this the uh, depopulated village are actually now becoming the right place where to live uh, compared to the urban areas and we were something that we were doing already since 2006 because when Sandra Jane decided to start a studio based on you know on this place we as a, as a group of people young people we started to really uh, working on it and to prepare and, and coming back every time proposing project events renovating uh, renovating little places until we got this house uh, this building in the old town this is something we uh, we uh, like because of uh, a memorandum of understanding between London Met and uh, the municipality uh, they the, the municipality offered this building as uh, that is on, his own like he owns as a place like a headquarter for students when they would come to Belmont and but they never had they never had proper money to finish it because the structure was fine the window were fine but the, the finishing were not done so with the collective, with the La Rivoluzione Le Seppie, we started to renovate three rooms already in 2019. But this year, we use this room for, digit, for the main group of us as a co-working space after COVID, because it was the only way we could use this space instead of organizing big, event, big events and stuff. But we really wanted to use it to not leave the village uh, for such a long time. So this was uh, so what we needed to use this space because it was only three rooms of furniture and only light as a service. Well, we needed Wi-Fi and we needed a toilet. <laughs> so these were the main two tools we in, in few people we built this summer and this allowed the, the space to be used on the daily use, even if it still needs a lot of work on it. And that's why how all the proposal to Jane and Sandra started like in a way that we have this space and we have a lot of a lot of space in the village and the village the people already know the place and why we don't uh, why I, as an association we can can we offer this space to use to the two students so some students at the end took this offer and now we are using um, the space as a um, which actually I mean now as a co-working space, but also co-living. So it's kind of a temporary studio until situation in also until we don't know what how gonna happen in general because it's still an ongoing experiment. We are here since a, since a month, and uh, it all depends on what's happening in, in terms of like bigger scale. Uh, um, yeah, in bigger scale in terms of like COVID, but also how are we going to live again in urban area? How are we going to use public space? All this question that's now coming up, obviously, is all depending on what's happening that we're going to react as well. But in the meantime, it's been like an, a, a very interesting, at least this is very personal, <laughs> what we can ask to the students that are still here as well. But um, very, I mean, it motivated, um, in, in environment and uh, in the same time you have the kind of more rural area kind of peace that otherwise in big city you are losing but this is a whole story also kind of we know and this is miles for example sketching on the sea <laughs> thank you i guess yeah after for the question i think if also students yeah. are here so it would be a nice if you want to give it us to them as well. <laughs> Sorry, say that again, Rita. No, I said maybe later as well because students are here with the queer, queer question. Like might, they might intervene if someone has specific question. I guess, oh, great! More yes. Than... <laughs> well, I think okay. I just put this in the chat, but just to say that ordinarily we have questions after the speakers have finished presenting. But if you think of something you'd like to ask 
midway through, then please do stick it in the chat just so you don't forget. And then at the end, I can call on you uh, to speak and ask your question. Thank you so much, Rita. That was really interesting and beautiful photographs. And mm -hmm. I'll pass straight over to Nicola. Thanks, Jane. Um, so I'm going to talk about representations of the home during COVID-19 lockdown. So I began this project in April to explore our relationships to our homes during lockdown, as we were forced to engage with them in a new, intense way. It was an opportunity to reflect on the successes and failures of different housing types from the tower block to the detached suburban house to the bedsit, that we might learn something for the future of housing design. The starting point came when stuck in my one bed flat during lockdown, I noticed that my conception of space started to change. The journey from one room to another suddenly felt longer, as if my mind was kindly deceiving me that my flat was bigger than it really is. Um, this man who ran a marathon on his seven metre balcony during France's lockdown and um, clearly enlarged his conception of his domestic space. I suggested that with the office, school, pub, cinema, place of worship and gym suddenly contained within the home, we may imagine that the city is shrunk down to the house, that our house has become a miniature city structure. Or we may feel like this idea is nonsense that we've been confined to a house with no access to the city. Architect Aldo van Eyck wrote that a house must be like a small city if it's to be a real house. A city like a large house if it's to be a real city. So um, the project sought to build up a rich, authentic collection of images and texts to investigate how we think about our homes and if this has changed during lockdown. I wanted a range of contributions from different housing types and backgrounds, particularly non-architect, and um, with varying success. We focused on one room per week, recognising that rooms are the units of space we think in and dream in. They invite a particular decorum, sets of behaviours, rituals and expectations. And so each week I sent out a briefing which summarised the history of each room and raised questions about how we might be relating to the room differently during lockdown um, with thought-provoking artworks. I asked contributors to respond with a sketch, note, painting, poem, poem or photograph relating to that room in their home. It might be a dry observation or an emotional response, it might be profound or mundane. There were 28 participants with a total of 101 entries across the seven weeks um, and I'm going to share a small selection of these with you. So the first week we looked at the threshold between public and private which might be a doorstep or a garden, a damp communal staircase or a walkway overlooking the city. During lockdown the distinction between public and private space was more pronounced with restrictions on our use of public space. People who are shielding may not have crossed this threshold, while others were embracing it once a day. The balcony has now become a threshold into a public space for me, a window into and across the city, a smile or a wave to my neighbours across the way. I live for these little fleeting connections. Living in a one bedroom flat in a small block, the description public private threshold seems very apt. As we return from our daily outdoor exercise, it's a clear reminder of the difference between the outside, fresh air, space, freedom, other people, and the inside, safety, confinement, comfort, and just us. The corridor, with an amazingly soft carpet, takes us past three neighbors front doors before we come to our own flat. In the current environment, I'm very conscious that they could come out of their flat just as we walk past and immediately we would be less than six feet apart. I therefore illogically hurry past faster than I used to. Our threshold is pretty abrupt. It goes door to the flat, 
door to the street within a two metre communal hall. And from door to street, it's again fairly sharp. No front garden, no pathway, no step. Just open your door and there's the street. I wonder if I've taken photos of the threshold and recall capturing a range when we had to get permission from the landlord to install our fibre optic line, now feeling that that hassle was worth it more than ever. Next time I'm hanging around on the pavement, I might look up at those junction boxes and cables and wonder which one is our corridor, our precious portal. I probably won't know as I'll be desperately trying to find my keys without actually touching anything and transitioning through the thresholds as swiftly as possible in case someone walks past and contaminates our pristine airlock. I mean, walks past and sees our lacklustre communal hallway. Lockdown heightened people's feeling towards the public private threshold. With some craving conversations with neighbours in the communal corridor and excited to see and be seen at the weekly Thursday clapping. Others were anxious about leaving their private sphere and saw their front garden as a defensive buffer zone or valued having a series of transitionary spaces which softened their threshold. Some saw their front door as a threshold to safety, for example, to protect a vulnerable baby, while for others it was an unwelcome reminder of their circumstance. Entering the home, we looked at the hall and corridor. In the Middle Ages, the hall was the main space of the house. So over time, the corridor emerged as a tool for separating spaces and people. The rise of open plan spaces has blurred the boundary between circulation and room. But perhaps lockdown reveals the strength of the, the corridor as a street within the house as a city. I used to think our flat was small, but during lockdown, I realised it's important to make the most of any space. A common sight for Michael was me pacing up and down the hall, trying to hit 10,000 steps. The hall is such an important space in our flat, creating a sequence of valuable small spaces. The main landing fits a small desk, creating a study which has been key to my working from home setup. The final hall space has a small alcove home to the Hoover and art supplies, classic companions. Corridor for two-year-olds. Coming and going. Or running track. Repair shop. Indoor-outdoors. Dance floor. Obstacle course. Reading spot. Hall and corridor are at the root of our flat. I suppose this type of layout is by some measures old-fashioned or boring, but in times of a global pandemic, I am glad I have got separate rooms that can be closed off if needed, as opposed to larger open plan space. Our corridor's wall space is almost entirely taken up by doors, making it work very hard. It is an efficient space. The hallway is just about the size of a yoga mat with a little space to spare, so in need it becomes my world's smallest yoga studio. During lockdown, the hall and corridor have become more valuable for those in small flats who need to make the most of all spaces, reimagining it as a place to practice yoga or to work. In larger homes, its function hasn't changed and it's used purely for circulation. For some, the corridor is the new commute. For others, it provides quiet moments to transition to other corners of the house. And for two-year-olds, the corridor can be all sorts of fun things. We thought about the living room's ability to perform many functions. Often the setting for daily family life or for entertaining guests. It can be called on for anything which does not fit the more narrowly defined rooms but it might also be part of the dining room, the office and the kitchen, all in one. Office in a small city depicts a solitary figure, physically and emotionally detached from his surroundings and other people. It was described by the artist's wife as the man in the concrete wall. My living room, now a small office, is high up in a concrete tower and it's glazed on two sides. My dining table, now my desk, faces the window overlooking London, and I sit most days in stillness, much like the figure in Hopper's painting, though without the waistcoat. We really live here. If needed, we could stay in this room all day. 
We meet dinosaurs, build boats, put out fires, draw thunderstorms, sing songs, drive trains, create building sites, dance dances. And at the end of the day, when all is quiet, Mummy and Daddy sit and drink wine. We used to have a strange grey rug that sprawled across our wooden floor. It stretched from near the bookcase over halfway to the door. It was hairy, thick long tufts of hair that softly swallowed up your toes, but also swallowed dust and dirt and bits of food half decomposed. We couldn't believe just how easy it was to rearrange the room. Once working from home meant both of us suddenly needed a desk from which to zoom. To make room for a table in prime position, the rug was ripped up and bundled, undignified, into the bottom of the wardrobe. For many, the living room remained primarily a space to relax, even if it took on new functions as a gym or a church. While no longer a place to entertain friends in person, it was the room from which people video called. So it's still the main location for socialising. For those who needed to find a new workspace, the living room was particularly vulnerable to being taken over, diluting its core purpose as boundaries of work life and home life are blurred. The value of a dedicated dining room has been recognised since the ancient Greeks and Romans, whose dining rooms combined entertainment and feasting. But the dining room has often only been in reach of the wealthy, and today it's often one with the kitchen or living room in an open plan layout. Dining meets our need for food, but it's also a social experience with a performative aspect, lost during lockdown. We don't have a dining room. There is a kitchen, living room, dining room merge. I used to love this, but it has made the divide between work and home difficult. At the moment, we're constantly shifting the table between office space and somewhere to eat, relax and switch off. Our dining room forms part of the larger living TV room. Rarely used for said purpose, except special occasions and lively gatherings. The one use we have had for the dining room table since lockdown has been as an imaginary restaurant, a change of scenery, a feeling of something special, a treat. For me, the dining room is the centre of the house. Physically, it sits snug in the middle of the ground floor, but it's also the heart of our family life. It's where we'll sit for hours chatting after delicious feasts, express through arts and crafts, and unwind on a Saturday morning reading papers strewn across the long wooden table. The only major changes really over the years have been the new tablecloths that get laid straight on top of the last. You could tunnel down through the historic layers of tablecloth like an archaeological dig. People describe the dining room as the centre of family life and big feasts, longing for the day where they could entertain again. While those in the spare dining room for special occasions rarely used during lockdown, for many the dining table doubled up as the desk with a daily annoyance of shifting between the two. In contrast, one person who normally after work would fall exhausted onto the sofa with a fork and pasta bowl found it easier during lockdown to have a proper family dinner time with no commute and the need to plan food shopping in advance. Uh, my friend and architect Mariana Janovic did a guest, take guest takeover for this week, drawing on her previous research into the domestic kitchen as articulation of the soul, or as articulation of the social. In her words, the kitchen is perhaps most emotionally charged room of them all. The heart of the home, it carries ideas about care, comfort and domesticity and has been entangled with the issue of labour and gender roles but also of efficiency and the organisation of a family. I love my kitchen. It is a light sunny space full of colour and art I have collected on my travels. It is a kitchen diner and friends will sit and chat to me whilst I cook or the place we sit for a cuppa. Now it is quiet with only one place set for dinner. I look forward to that changing. Orange, neon, love. We cook, eat, play, dance, clean, store and chill. 
be a triangulator on Entropy Island. Our kitchen is small, not tiny, but small enough that I run out of space if I, if I embark on any adventurous cooking or baking. Despite its size, I love it and have had many happy times spent here. It has lovely big windows overlooking the back garden, so I'll sit here and enjoy the calm before getting on with my day. Due to COVID-19, I'm currently not needed at work, so I found myself spending more time here baking cakes and experimenting with different meals, which has been a welcome distraction. I'm sure the time will come soon enough when the kitchen reverts back to being its useful, practical self once more, but for now I'm rather enjoying it. Across the respondents, the kitchen was being used like never before during lockdown for experiments in pickling, baking and cooking. They had the time and resources to do this, most not being frontline workers or in serious financial need. For many, the kitchen is the hub of the home where they spend the most time. Some praise a compact, functional space that makes food preparation easy with everything close at hand, while others enjoyed the multifunctionality of their large kitchens with dining tables and sofas. The bathroom has developed alongside our understanding of disease and public health, particularly topical during a global pandemic. The purposes, privacy and practicalities of bathing have changed with history, from the very public Roman baths, city-like in their architectural hierarchy and multiple functions, to today's clinical solitary <laughs> for mere surface ablution, lamented by Siegfried Gideon. Have you ever been in someone else's bathroom and snooped in the cabinets just for fun? I grant you permission to mine. What do the contents say about me? The frosted sash window is ideal for the bathroom, sliding up to reveal a view out to the sky and treetops when reclining in the bath, and sliding down to offer a standing eye-level view when showering. I love having a large window in the bathroom and hope to have such good natural light and ventilation in my future home. I often reflect on what a luxury hot water is when we live in a world where a third of the population does not have access to clean water. You will note the scabby floor. This was an impact of COVID-19. The new flooring was ordered and due for delivery the week lockdown started. Hopefully it will soon find its way to my home. The bathroom has a critical role to play in a pandemic, though it's least able to adapt or take on a new functional meaning. This might be reassuring, a sense of continuity when living rooms are becoming offices and bedrooms yoga studios. The bathroom might be the one place where you couldn't be disturbed by your newly homeschooled children. Having begun our journey at the public-private threshold, moving through increasingly private rooms of the house, we arrive at the bedroom. The idea of a private room primarily devoted to sleeping is relatively new. Only in the 19th century did social uses of the bedroom decline in favour of a private setting for sleep, sex and childbirth. Whether the bedroom today is a dedicated room for sleeping depends on the size of the home and who else lives there, especially in a house share. Our bedroom is a small space dominated by the double bed which sits centre stage. In such a small room, the bedstead is often used as a temporary home to hang or drape clothes and if ever we changed our bed, I would look for a footboard as a requirement for this very useful purpose. The majority of time spent in the bedroom is in slumber, though recently, with no school run to do and less places to go, I've spent longer sitting in bed in the mornings, consuming two cups of tea and listening to the radio, which previously was only reserved for the weekend. I'm thankful for our generous sized bedroom, as in a one bed London flat it must serve as more than simply a place to sleep. During lockdown we have stacked a suitcase on a plastic storage box and draped a stripy beach towel over the top. It is an ugly makeshift table but has a garden view and creates another setting for working or having lunch, bringing much needed variety to repetitive days inside. Dreaming supermoons. 
Church views and wedding vows over the garden. Long breakfasts in bed, forming stories and songs. My alphabet of art books, wrapping around a soft daybed. Multiverses explored through words and pictures. While some bedrooms can just about fit a bed in, others have space to repurpose for lunch or exercise. During lockdown, some are embracing the blurred boundaries between work and rest, turning up to video meetings in pyjamas and working from under the covers. Others are trying their best to maintain a division between work and rest, protecting the bedroom as a work-free zone, a sacred space. The responses we've seen and heard show that some people find it easy to reimagine their domestic spaces, whether it's purely in their mind or by reconfiguring furniture. Some might not be able to reimagine their homes or might not need to. They function perfectly well during lockdown. Others are struggling to cope with their too small, too dark homes, which lack generosity or a suitable space to work or access to the outdoors. The COVID-19 pandemic and the resultant lockdown have shaken up how we live, work and socialise. This project captured the initial peak of engaging with our homes in a new way, as it took place at the height of the first lockdown, April to early June. However, our perception of home and our expectations and priorities for its design are surely to be changed forever. Thank you to the many contributors. It was a delight to journey through your homes during a time when they were physically out of bounds. If you have any questions or would like a copy of the project book, you can contact me at nicola.blake.research at gmail.com. Thank you. Thanks, Nicola. It was incredibly interesting and I really enjoyed it. I'm sure everyone else will agree. And it, <laughs> Jennifer, we're going to... Oh, you're clapping. I thought you were putting your hands up, but that's like a cool clapping emoji. Oh, that's nice. I like it. I don't know how to do that, but I will try and figure it out. I think that's going to slide very nicely into Francis's presentation, I suspect. And I've got lots of questions myself. I'm going to start putting a question or two in the chat so that I don't forget them. Please do join me. Francis. Okay, well, um, I've broken all the rules of the, uh, of, of the, the term because I'm not talking about uh, representations of the home in lockdown. Uh, I'm coming at it in a way in a, in a dismantled sort of approach because I've been um, I've been researching the home as workplace and the workplace as home for nearly 20 years now. So this is this is, if you like, an absolute gallop through um, what I've done and what I've been doing in in co during COVID, which hasn't been looking at how people are inhabiting their homes. OK, so, so working from home has absolutely been the big story. Um, but it was the big story before COVID. Um, we'd already got millions of people working from home. Um, it was growing really rapidly. Um, we'd got 95% of UK businesses, uh, micro businesses, contributing a third of all employment and a fifth of all turnover, most run from their owners' homes. With huge implications for how we design and conceive our housing, our build, all our buildings and our cities. And this research started when I was teaching, um, when I was jointly running the first year with Chai Roberts at, um, at this School of Architecture. But in fact, it goes back a long way further than that because I developed, a, I realized a fascination with buildings that combine dwelling and workplace. Um, when I was an architectural student and squatted with a group of friends, this old shoe shop, um, and we inhabited the ground floor and the first floor as part of a big squat in Tolmer Square. So when Chai and I were teaching together, we decided to set this uh, project um, that combined for a, a building that combined dwelling and workplace. And I went off to the architectural library and found a, a vacuum where I thought there would be 
a great stack of books to, to introduce the project with. And so I suppose the research question that has guided my research for nearly 20 years now is how can we design well for home-based work? Um, and the first, the, my first task, if you like, was to establish the fact that, that uh, a building type exists, has done for hundreds, if not thousands of years in every culture and every country in the world that combines dwelling and workplace. Um, and I looked at, at the, the vernacular in England, um, little weavers houses to great big fire stations where the, there was room for 29 families of the firefighters and a dormitory for, for single firefighters, as well as looking at architectural history and found these buildings absolutely, um, uh, the architectural history is, is, is full of them, usually concealed in one way or another as a house or as a workshop or a studio. And so I, I made a close scrutiny of the lives and premises of 76 home-based workers um, in urban, suburban and, Engl in, and rural contexts in England and um, in a whole range of different occupations and different situations. And what emerged was uh, the first finding, if you like, was that they were extremely varied. And therefore, um, they, the, you know, just in this small sample, I had these eight categories of home-based workers and they had really distinct spatial needs. And then I went off to um, Japan and to the United States and to the Netherlands, and I did a, a, a substantial project in a, a housing trust with, with home-based workers in social housing and, and a project that's, that analyzed home-based work in two separate villages. And so I brought together a sort of great range of different, um, uh, of data um, on the homes and the lives of these different people. And I found that there were very few that actually had purpose built space like this architect. And that most were, as we now, all of us know, working from the kitchen table or in the bedroom. In social housing, much more difficult, um, especially because there's very tight spatial uh, constraints and often governance constraints as well, tenancy agreements that prohibit um, working from home and often work that isn't just sitting at a computer. And also really problematic for people whose work doesn't involve sitting at a computer. Yeah, sorry, I just said that. So um, for whom there, there are, are really a substantial number. So I went through a, a, a visual research um, methodology of having drawn plans of all the buildings and then analyzed them and, um, and a series of typologies emerged relating firstly to the dominant function, people who work in their homes and then people who live at their workplace and people who inhabit buildings that have an equal status for the work and for the home on the street. The second typology was uh, the actual um, involved the, the spatial relationship between the work and the home. And I found that different people liked really different relationships. So the live with was with a single front door into all the different spaces, both home and work. And then there were the two front doors live adjacent, like the fish and chip shop, where you have the, the, the door to the flat upstairs and the separate door to the fish and chip shop. And then the live nearby where you've just got a few steps, which I found to be the most popular. Um, this building surveyor who craned a porter cabin into the garden of his, his uh, terraced house when his wife was ill and he needed to be at home to look after his children. So the first, I suppose the second thing I learned was that one size absolutely doesn't fit all and that there are four variables relating to the occupation the nature of the household, the space available, the personality of the home-based worker. People like to work in completely different ways. Some people like to keep their work and their home totally separate. Other people don't distinguish between the two aspects of their life. Some people like to work in a really sociable way. Other people like to, like to um, 
to work in a very private, secluded, quiet space. But what we build in our housing is just um, spaces where we can cook, eat, bathe, sleep, look after our children and watch television. And this leads to enormous problems for home-based workers. Um, and 43% of the homes that we've built since 2002 are purpose-built, um, tight fit flats with an average usable floor area of 55 square meters, which is really problematic for home-based workers. And uh, what I found is that where people have inadequate or in inappropriate space, and I think this has become really clear during COVID, um, they have major problems with social isolation, occupation identity, and just, just sheer, sheer unhappiness. So I wrote a book, as, as Jane said, in 2015. I got involved with um, making policy for the OECD in 2018. Um, I was involved in another book last year um, with Delft um, Housing Research Unit. But really, I was starting to lose heart because uh, the research simply wasn't getting anywhere because it seemed to always go into the too difficult to do book. Um, and people just said, well, that's very nice, but actually we can't do that for one reason or another. And then COVID happened. And, uh, and obviously this is a sort of massive global experiment in home-based work. Um, it jumped to 50% in April. I don't, not quite sure what it is at the moment in the UK. Um, whoops. Uh, and, and the research is really, really clear. People like it. People, um, the surveys show people are happier, they're healthier, they're sleeping better, they walk the dog instead of going to the gym, they, um, and they're more productive. So the employers like it too. And so this is something that is going to stay. And so the sort of, the pressure to start to really serious design for it is, is on. So I'm interpreting this as a paradigm shift, uh, a massive, uh, change in the way that we think about our buildings and our cities and um, and consider that there are immediate policy implications in terms of the need for more space in our homes. We need to review our policy documents. Uh, when the, the London plan draft went out, I, I sent in a consultation thing saying, you just, you've only mentioned home-based work twice. And this is a sort of really major issue um, in terms of how people are inhabiting their buildings and the, and, and the city. And now, of course, it's happening big time. So we have all sorts of really major problems with our governance instruments, um, like our um, planning and property taxation um, that simply don't work around uh, designing for home-based work. And, and I think this is, this is going to present the really the biggest urban opportunity, challenge and opportunity since Ebenezer Howard's Garden City idea. It's a sort of huge turnaround of a, 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 a juggernaut that's been heading steadily in a single direction for nearly a hundred years now. Crucial design themes that have emerged are spatial generosity, we need more space, agency, um, people need to be able to really inhabit space as they want to. Um, the, 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 the sort of standard apartment or house that just is designed around very minimal domestic um, functions really, really doesn't work for home-based work. And so, so um, there are so, all sorts of uh, possible ways of, uh, of, bringing agency into, into the design of our, of our houses and our buildings. And visibility, the whole issue of home-based work needing to be visible on the street, either actually to the passerby or in terms of, um, of, of local community knowledge um, as, as a way of, of, of uh, uh, reducing issues of social isolation and ways of actually uh, uh, 
the home ways that the home based work can actually contribute to the neighborhood and develop the, the local economy and local social networks. One of the crucial things that I think one of the most important things that's emerged through COVID is the sort of massive social injustice in housing um, that there's been a very uh, a very clear division between who's been able to work from home and who hasn't. Um, I think this was April, no, maybe May and May. And uh, m most middle class workers were working from home and only one in five working class workers. And this is in part because of housing policy that has, has uh, meant that people get are allocated so little space that the housing is so small and so many people have to live in it there is just isn't anywhere for people to work it's also to do with um governance problems tenancy agreements that from from a uh, hundred years ago where home-based work was really disapproved disapproved of the tenancy agreements many of them still prohibit it so this is a really interesting and major issue that needs to be addressed the whole issue of what's going to happen to our commercial buildings. Um, it looks as if um, half, half commercial buildings in central uh, business districts and high streets uh, will be empty as a result of home based work because obviously um, corporations, companies find that they can really save on these overheads. British Telecom, who have been running, um, have had a home based work policy for 15 years now they found that they save 5,000 pounds per home-based worker per year um, in terms of overheads. And they've reduced their, their overall um, corporate footprint by 50%. So this, this opens up all sorts of really interesting possibilities. Obviously it opens up the horrors in terms of um, developing it, it into very poor standard slum housing. But it also means that the possibility is there for, for these buildings to be used in a way like the, the light industrial buildings were used by artists and makers um, when industry moved out of the city. So it's possible that these buildings may be repurposed in a very creative way. Um, so with some colleagues, um, architects and housing people and um, theorists, um, we've set up this little not-for-profit um, to actually to actually promote good design for home-based work and we're writing articles papers blogs one of the things I I I didn't want to do was to look at how people are inhabiting a working from home during lockdown because I think that says so much about lockdown and what I'm really interested in is how we whoops how we work from home, how we design for home-based work as an ongoing challenge, um, particularly considering that um, most people like it. Obviously it doesn't work for everyone, but the, the, the prediction at the moment is that 30% uh, of people will work in the office all the time, 30% will work from home all the time, and 40% will do a bit of each. And it seems that most people would like to work from home two or three days a week where they have the space. Um, so uh, we're doing podcasts and presenting at events and teaching and influencing policy. And in a way, this is the bit that I think is potentially has a real um, potential impact is that uh, People are realizing that we have to change how we think about and how we design our, our, um, our buildings. So this was a, um, a survey done by um, Place Alliance with Urban Design London and it went out to two and a half thousand people. And one of, their, um, one of their findings is that the nationally described space standards need to be amended to reflect working from home so that everyone should be able to work comfortably from home. Um, these are other ones that are, are, are going on. These are all party parliamentary groups. So it's governmental policy, um, uh, advisory groups, 
and this one shown here improving opportunities how to support social housing tenants into sustainable employment because um, there's an incredible disparity between um, and in unemployment, very high unemployment in social housing. And we argue that one of the reasons for that is that the conditions are so poor in social housing that it makes life, it makes it almost impossible for people to work from home. Um, and that's, that's a route into employment that then is blocked off for, for those people who are disproportionately um, people of color. So this is a, a sort of issue of social justice. So um, they accepted our evidence and um, we've, uh, we've input, inputted into this report in about seven different ways, which is great. We've just been invited to, to contribute to the suburban task force who are thinking about um, the future of the suburbs and the Welsh government is thinking about home-based work in relationship to uh, mandatory quality standards for new homes. So I'm just going to finish with a, a little something that is slightly bonkers that I'm also doing um, and have been doing through lockdown, which is a collaboration with Claudia Dutson at the Royal College of Art. Um, uh, we presented together at a, 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 a symposium about 18 months ago at the Design Museum, which was about designing time, uh, because which I, I'm extremely interested in, because when you work from home, you can design your time yourself you're not necessarily so uh, uh, hemmed in by external time factors. And, and Claudia researches Silicon Valley and we were paired. And um, so this is her plan of, not quite finished, plan of um, Heatherwick's new Google building. And this is the building that I was presenting. And so this is um, 17th century London with a, a little analysis of, and this, for me, this is really interesting because it's very rare to have an urban, uh, an urban block that shows home-based work. So you've got the, the workplaces that line the streets, you've got an inner courtyard that's with houses around it and houses, home, sorry, housing around it and homes behind the shops and above them and little um, semi, semi-private yards with sheds in it. And then this is the two together. And, um, and this is why we decided to do this little project was to actually look at the impact on the city of designing for home-based work and designing for, uh, for, for the big tech companies. And we were interested in the patterns that emerged, but um, my plan fits into hers about 30 times. And in mine, there are, 24 doors that that connect the public and the private realm and in hers there are five so in mine there are 24 just in the little one so it's 750 anyway so so this is what i've been getting up to and obviously i have uh, really probably missed the point of the uh, the seminar but that's that's the impact of my research and how covid has been um, how i've been responding to it Thank you very much, Francis. Three really delicious and enjoyable presentations. Thank you so much to the speakers, to Rita and to Nicola and to Francis. Now we've got half an hour left today to take questions. The audience, I've said this already, but now it's even more important. If you're willing, it would be fabulous if you could switch on your camera and then everybody can see each other it just makes it more fun than looking at a name and it's, it's nice to feel like you're talking to human beings. Clive, you made an interesting comment in the chat. Would you like to say it out loud with your own voice? Uh, certainly. Uh, what did I say? Oh, um, well, it was actually a, a comment to Nicola, uh, uh, excuse me, Nicola, um, to uh, ask if that research was available so I could get in front of my students. I'm teaching a studio right now where we're looking at the home as a, uh, by being kind of confined to the home, we're looking at how uh, through metaphor one can connect to the home beyond itself, uh, to the cosmos, uh, to look broadly, uh, we'll think broadly about that. But um, between, you know, one's body and the cosmos, of course, there are a whole load of civic institutions and 
natural orders that kind of unfold temporarily. So I was, I was also, um, my interest was piqued by uh, um, Francis's comment about temporality and designing time, because we are actually looking at the home uh, entirely through temporal cycles and tem temporal unfoldings before we look at it in any kind of spatial sense. And now looking at the degree to which um, temporalities kind of precipitate into, uh, I guess, uh, fabricated material, uh, existing fabricated material of their homes that they currently live in, but also potentially modifications to that as we get into the design phase. So, um, uh, the, the, yeah, the, but both presentations, were, well, all, all three presentations, but in particular, this, uh, Nicholas and, um, uh, well, Nicholas in particular was uh, especially something I'd like my students to be able to listen to and watch uh, and get the benefit that I got from it <laughs> just, just before. Yeah, um, thanks guys. Um, yeah, I can definitely um, send you the, the research. I've, I put my email address at the end of the slide, so um, if you contact me on there, um, I can share that research with you. Um, and yeah, I think that question about that, that what you're looking at in your studio about um, the home as a metaphor for the cosmos, or uh, it would be great to, hit, um, to find out more about that at some point as well. Um, I think a few people have, I've seen a few sort of articles written about um, yeah, how our conception of, of the home has changed in this time and that it sort of necessarily has become this sort of TARDIS-like um, series of spaces because we're our sort of, um, our access to the city has been so reduced. Um, I thought there was so much to identify with in all three presentations, particularly that sense of your complete remodeling of your own mental conception of where you live. I wondered the three presenters, do you have questions or comments uh, for your fellow presenters? Any of you? Maybe even just to tell each other how great you are. <laughs> Well, I loved both of the other presentations and I thought it was, I, 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 I thought that Nicola, your work is beautiful. It's really, really special. And um, I love the way you've put it together and your, your methodology of inviting people to submit on these different particular themes. It seems to work really, really well. Um, and many of the comments uh, chimed with, with because obviously I've talked to I've talked to hundreds of people who work from home, and they there, there was a lot of chiming in in there. But um, no, I, I I'm interested in what you're going to in 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 where that takes you next in a way. If you think that's a coherent piece of work, or if it's actually leading you onwards to something else. Um, yes, well, thanks, Francis. Um, I guess listening to your presentation, um, um, well, you've got you know just a wealth of um, of knowledge there, which is really interesting. And uh, yeah, like I've been looking a bit at like, your work home um, website, and um, there's so many great resources on that. Um, I think um, the way you talk about um, sort of social housing. Um, and the difficulties of social housing and um, home live work spaces um, highlights something that I'm already aware of in this small piece of research of mine and that I, I set out to, um, to include a, a diverse and broad audience but in reality in this small piece of research it's, re it's really not a diverse set of um, contributors and I think the research will really benefit from um, a broader range of contributors um, that represents the, the population in the UK. Um, because I think on the whole, uh, people involved in my project have had fairly positive experiences of lockdown. Um, so I think there's a question about diversity um, in terms of taking the project forward, um, about it being, it being a bigger study generally, um, as well as, I wonder if um, I think it'd be worth in sort of mapping these qualitative, qualitative responses onto um, different housing typologies, 
in maybe architectural plans and sections um, that there might be a more sort of analytical um, side to the research too. Um, but, but I mean, I also enjoy this, in this project um, that it is fairly, um, that there's room for people to be creative and to, that it, it does have this, this sort of qualitative character to it. Um, so yeah, there are some ways I think I could um, could take it forward, um, and also thinking about the method, this methodology and how it how it might work um, for other topics um, as a way of engaging um, non architects um, and a broad range of people um, into questions about architecture and urbanism, mm. making that accessible and like fun and creative. I think it's really interesting because I think that in COVID, um, the young and the poor are the people who've really suffered. And so, Rita, I was interested in yours um, because I, the idea of this collective building, I thought was fascinating. And I wondered where you all live, where do you sleep? Do you, do you all sleep there as well? Or you all have separate places and you go and you come, okay. Yeah, no, we sleep in the village. So we, us as a collective, but also students at the moment are subletting from uh, the people here. Like they're taking empty houses that they usually use only in summers for uh, then. So we is basically like we go to, yeah, it's a good point actually, because yeah, we, they sleep, we, us sleep there but then we come, we come every morning here to work and then at around dinner time everyone come back to the house and but the, in the 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 student at the moment they all live in a one big like two big houses that are connected so also in uh, living is kind of together and the idea is that uh, because another two people two people from the collective is coming in next week we're gonna be around 15 people um, to keep having dinner together. We thought as well to start to cook in this place because in the summer we were also cooking in the in this place. We have we made a, a, like a external cooker uh, cooking a kitchen. So it's a bit in between, but because it's almost like uh, the village, as because it's very small, it becomes more almost like a. A diff like a, an architecture itself, a, a building itself. So it's all like a, a diffuse campus or a diffuse living room. And like with the new restriction, for example, in Italy, after six, all the bars and restaurants need to close. For us, it was a very, was the first time COVID restriction really touched this small place because we have a, there is a one only bar, cafe, where the, there is everything. We go there for, having a beer for coffee, for restaurant, for pizza, for playing cards, for meeting the locals. And, and we are always the same people there because obviously you don't see anyone else. Like there are only 20 people that seen uh, coming at the bar because the old village, the old town is uh, inhabited by only 50 people as well. Um, so yeah, that's, it's also the bar was part of this kind of living space that it was diffused more in, in the village itself, which is also a bit, um, interesting between outside and uh, what is private and what is public, basically, yeah. And the sleeping at the moment is the only real public, real private per part, let's say. Well, there's a, a note from Jane McAllister in the chat. Jane, do you want to ask yourself? Yeah, sorry, sorry, myself on you. Maybe yeah, talk no, about what you were interested in. Yeah, I mean, it was, um, it was, uh, it went a bit too quickly. So I, I just want, I wondered if Frances could, could talk in a little more detail about the, the two plans that she showed right at the end. Um, cause she, she went very quickly over it and it, 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 it felt that they were, um, really kind of stuffed with interesting information. Um, would that, would that be possible, Frances? Yeah. Shall I show the, shall I share the screen again? Yeah, do. yeah, 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 perfect. This one. Yes? I assume so. Yeah, that was the one, was it, Jane? 
She's gone away. Let's assume no, no, it was. No, 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 I was on mute, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, I was on mute, really sorry about that. Okay. No, it was just um, the scale thing and, and the way that you got into them, the doors, the way you circulated around them. I thought it was really fascinating, Francis. Well, we, well, it, it's fairly bonkers, really, um, to be comparing a, a 2020 building with uh, a fragment of the city from 1612. But we, when we were doing this presentation, which was about designing time, and, and I was talking about working from home and designing time, and she was talking about sort of living at the workplace because uh, Google workplaces, as everyone knows, these, these tech um, companies, they sort of, they sort of pretend that you bring your whole life here. And, and it was when we were discussing it and we looked at these two, we were, we just had, we were one after the other, we were paired. And, and, and um, Claudia looked at mine and she said, it's just like mine. And I looked at hers and I thought, it is so different from mine. And so we were really interested in our own responses to each other's plans. And so we've set around, we've set, a, we've set about analyzing them in terms of staircases and how, in terms of, well, the three, the three, the three themes that we're an, analyzing are permeability, uh, public and private, and urban inclusivity. So- um, All right, okay. So that's so that's what we're that's what we're looking at, and that is the so that is the actual scale. So that's a it's a it's um there are I think twenty two dwellings, well they're work homes on this on this little tiny site here, but when you actually when you actually um, overlay them the number of people that would have inhabited this amounts extraordinarily to the same number of employees that Google has here. So, so we're looking at routes through, and, and obviously um, Google only, Google is, it's like a fortress. Um, it, it's meant to be a building that is very open and the public are, are, are welcome, but there's, a, there's an entrance here and there's an entrance here and the public basically are allowed to go through this little tunnel. They're not allowed to have anything to do with what's actually going here. Whereas the public in this one, the, the plan, the, the, the block is completely hollowed out to maximize its surface area. So that, so that and members of the public have, it, it's the, the Yang Gale thing of the, um, the soft facade that where, where you maximize the, what's happening and I think there are entrances every four meters on average on, on this plan. I oh, know that, that, that's really fascinating. I just, Francis, I, I'm, I'm sure you've come across the, um, the Robin Evans chapter on, I think it's called Corridors and Passages. No, I haven't. I, well, should... I, should, I, I just wondered if this, this could be an, a really interesting update to that, um, to that essay. It's in... Um, okay. Um, translations from buildings to or the other way around from drawings to buildings that's right I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll send you the passage that would be lovely Jane thank you okay let me stop this share thank you one of the things that I really found astonishing I think between Nicola and Francis was the fact that we all use our homes in these very similar ways everybody sleeps in their bedroom and everybody dines in the dining room and so forth and for the majority of people we might not have had a workspace previously a, a fixed workspace but yet the workspaces have migrated to similar places in everybody's homes in terms of their being on the on the landing or in the hall or I mean in my case it's just behind the sofa in the living room and yeah I wondered if you could say something about how similar we all are and why that might be what what your reflections are on that yeah. well i suppose that my from my perspective um 
I think, well, it's interesting. Are we similar? How similar are we? I, I think that in my research, what I've found is that people are incredibly ingenious and they, they make the absolute most of whatever they've got. So people are aware of the real problems. And in lockdown, obviously, I've been, I, I've been very busy following. Um, lots of people are, are mapping what, how they're working from home. Some people use the bathroom, you know, because acoustic separation is super important. And in many homes, you, don't, you can't get that except in the bathroom. And so people go in and they sit on the toilet and they have something in front of them. And then they can, they can obviously it's not so great for a Zoom call, but, um, but it means they have separation from the rest of the household, which is one of the really, really big issues. So maybe, maybe the similarities are more to do with the examples coming from similar, similar socioeconomic status, similar sorts of professions and similar sorts of buildings. I mean, in Nicholas, I was really struck by the number of dining rooms. I don't have a dining room, but it's like, <laughs> but I do know from my research that the middle classes, they, 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 um, they accommodate their home-based work through under occupation. So, so disused or underused dining room, uh, spare bedroom, uh, Mm. disused garage or space at the bottom of the garden to build some kind of a shed are really common factors mm. so i think maybe that's more to do with the the mm. limitations of the sample jane rather than us all being super similar you think that's is that true from your observations rita in italy how, how are people accommodating their home-based work <laughs> and how are they living differently in their homes or how were they during lockdown uh, well I guess in Italy was, um, we also have to look at the different stage we had because we, when we was the first lockdown was really strict. So everyone needed to adapt. They couldn't even go for a walk or was not like was less open than what happened in England, for example, that I heard from other friends. But for example, that what really, yeah, was all these, um, that's why when I heard the balcony of Nicole, I thought how this space became really an important space at the beginning of the lockdown in Italy because it was the only open air space we had. But also, like, I was struggling, I was um, impressed by the law was really important everywhere, like police was really strict and people were somehow sometimes more scared than getting a fine than having, getting uh, COVID, uh, like getting the issue with COVID itself. But then, because there are some uh, suburban areas in uh, very, like Naples, like with Quartieri Spagnoli or other like very poor neighborhood where people lived on the ground level of the building and they have a room for, for people and they wouldn't mind of the law and they would just open the door, keep using the street as they open it. And, and that was allowed even if it was like on the street because of, um, because of their condition, they, could, they couldn't they um, could do anything else otherwise. So yeah, I guess um, there are similarities as uh, Francis said, depending on uh, where, where you are, if it's urban or rural area, because now also think, like actually this, um, this lecture or seminar was really good because um, this presentation today was not a research for me like is for Nicole or Francis. It was mainly an experiment we're doing and more like an active uh, an action we're doing in this village. But if just uh, putting um, bringing the methodology that um, that Nicole apl uh, applied for her, for her home for her research on a village. We are using this village as a home and how you like, yeah. And then, because this is what is changed between urban area, you have the whole village that you can use instead of a small place. And also this difference maybe are kind of interesting to think of between mm. where you are with your building, I guess, mm. uh, with your home. Um, Matthew, yeah, you may do, think... sorry, Nicola. Sorry, Jane. Go no, ahead. no, go ahead, go ahead. And um, I think, 
um, listening to Francis and Rita made me think that, yeah, maybe um, my sample is quite um, narrow because um, I, I was going to say that, well, you know, the bathroom and the kitchen, um, they've got their very clear functions, um, they're very like practical spaces, um, they don't seem like obvious um, candidates to become uh, a working space. So I'm interested that to hear that um, the bathroom is used as a working space for some people. Um, and I think maybe the fact that we use um, the living room maybe or corridor space is, is partly because uh, I guess that they maybe say half of my participants live in quite small London flats and they don't have a dining room or they don't have a, uh, you know, a garage or a, a spare space. So, you know, the living room or the hallway is kind of the obvious candidate, but, um, but then there are some, uh, a few of my contributors are, have sort of suburban homes with, with spare rooms and they are obviously obvious candidates for um, an office space. Um, so, yeah, are we are we all similar, or you know, is it yeah, is it just about the the home that we live in and like what's physically available there? Mm. Matthew, mate, you made an interesting comment in the chat, and I wondered if you wanted to ask a question. Uh, yeah, so I was um, hi everyone. I was going to um, well the the comment that I make was just addressing the question of the interface between the home as a uh, it's an obvious thing to say, but the home is a real concrete place and an imaginary thing. And um, Nicola's work in particular raised this whole compendium of domestic imaginaries for us very beautifully. Um, and then we got uh, the fascinating story from Rita of a sort of uh, domestic experiment with a new kind of home engaging with refugees and migrants uh, for whom the question of home is so um, uh, controversial and difficult and often fraught with other issues um, and and Francis putting all kinds of scary figures in front of us which ask us to rethink uh, what we mean by the gap between work and home and actually this evening or this afternoon I was cycling back from my office which I can luckily go to uh, um, I'm going in about three days a week um, and I was cycling back and thinking how annoyed I was that I was going home to work because I used to enjoy being able to leave the office and go back home to be at home and now of course you know we, we're hearing these corporations are going to save money by putting the workplace back on us and also trapping us in the home as a place of work so I don't feel very positively about this new imaginary of the home. Uh, and I love the optimism, um, but I also think there's a, a, a politics in this. So um, I've rambled a little bit, but I guess I'm looking at this gap between the real home and the imaginary home and how we can use these new imaginaries to feel stronger and better. But also we need to think about the politics of it because in some ways, this imaginary, especially in some of the work of Nicholas, which I've looked at really carefully. Thank you, Nicola, for sending it to me. Um, and half of them are critiques, and then the other half are about nostalgia. And I think that when we are under pressure, and I've looked at this in my research, which often looks at the home in um, uh, in the global south, in, in, in situations of informal urban dwellings, um, that when you have no control over the world around you and you're in a situation of crisis, you come to the space you can control, which is your desk or your home or the tiny little space and you start cleaning like mad and cooking delicious meals and posting pictures of your home on Instagram. And it's great, but it's not the solution. And I, I sort of think that we need to take a bit of power from this situation and fight back at the same time as we create new directions for research uh, and, 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 and think about how the future can change, but I think the future should be changing on our terms. Thank you, Matthew. Do you want to respond to that panel? I'd like to. Go ahead. <clears throat> I, I, I completely understand where you're coming from, Matthew, and I think that 
Home-based work absolutely doesn't work for everyone and should never be imposed. And that's why, in a way, I haven't wanted to research it during lockdown because it's such an artificial and I feel um, inappropriate uh, situation because I don't think people should be forced to work from home. Um, I agree that we have to look at the politics of it very carefully, but I have now interviewed an awful lot of people and people save a lot of money by not traveling. They save a lot of time. They save a lot of stress. They don't have to buy fancy clothes to go to work in. You know, there are all sorts of ways that they benefit. And so the whole idea, and I've, I see this written quite a lot, the idea that the workplace is being imposed on us um, actually, what I've found is that people on the whole, not all of them, but on the whole, that's not people's response. And in terms of the cynicism about corporations saving money, um, for me, there's a whole, you can flip this round and say, actually, there's a really strong environmental um, angle on this, which is that by working from home, we're using we're inhabiting the building stock more intensively and this is environmentally a far more sustainable thing to do there is something completely bonkers about the system that we have been employing which means that that roughly half our buildings are empty at any one time so our, our houses are all empty while we go out to work and our workplaces are all empty when we go home and and this is wasteful in a fundamental way and I, I really believe we need to have uh, workplaces I think that's important but I also think we need to have um, homes where we can work but I completely understand the need to be able to have the home as refuge as well and so I think that's an architectural problem so that's I think that's where design comes in because I think that you know setting up your desk on your kitchen table is a really bad plan. I think it's, I think it's enormously stressful and it crosses for most people. Some people like to work like that, but most people don't. So that's my, that's my Thanks, response. Francis. <laughs> a good response. And I'm, I'm sorry, there's no time left. Do you have a, do you have a sentence that you'd like to say in closing Nicola and Rita? Um, I guess maybe just re responding to, to Matthew's comment actually and um, that yeah I agree that this interface between the real and the imaginary is important because actually no matter how much um, I can reimagine my small one bed flat and um, create all of these extra spaces in my mind after a while in reality it you know it's too small it doesn't have access to outdoors and I, yeah so um, I think it's really important to bring all of these interesting imaginary um, questions um, into like, yeah, what does this, what does this mean physically? And yeah, um, what does it mean for people from all sorts of socioeconomic backgrounds and housing types? Um, and yeah, I look forward to like, um, just how all these questions will unfold over the coming years and what that means for, for our cities and, and our lives and our, and our workplaces. Thank you. Rita? Well, um, I agree a bit with um, also what I just, uh, I was reading with Jane, Jane comment about uh, there is a new balance to be imagined. And uh, on my side, the, also, because I'm talking about, I'm experiencing as, as well the difference between lockdown in a city or in a rural area. And this is a bit what, what Matthew was saying as well, like uh, I think is, this is happening now and then it's exaggerating because we know that all the rest of the world is, is stopped as well. I don't know if young people as, as uh, even younger as students, 20 years old would spend uh, three months in a village where there were only them around and dogs and cats mostly. But then it's because it's good, like, it's a good uh, time out from the city, but I don't know how much we could completely uh, live on that. So the gain is a balance maybe that we uh, start to think of um, after hopefully this situation has changed. 
Thank you, Rita. Thank you so much to all of the presenters, to Francis and Nicola and Rita. And I'd like to echo a comment that Matthew just made in the chat. It's been fantastic to see almost 50 people here today. And hopefully these seminars will prove to be an opportunity for colleagues to meet one another, for friend, new friends to be made, new connections. And it's quite heartening that we can do this in this otherwise very restrictive time. So it'd be great if just before you leave, turn on your microphone and say goodbye, and then we can hear people. And then just leave quickly. <laughs> goodbye. 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 Thanks everyone. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Nick, you're amazing. Bye. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye.